Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles, open them to Romans chapter 12. After a lengthy introduction here, we will land in Romans 12 because that's where we'll be spending our time for the next few weeks looking at the seven primary spiritual gifts. But today we want to look at the first few verses in a Bible study that I've entitled In This Together. Because that's the truth. We are in this together. And you can define this any way you would like to. Whatever it is you're into right now. Whatever it is, however it is you're living your life. Wherever it is that God has you, we are in this together. And when I say we, I mean the church. The family of God. We are in this together. And I don't merely mean this local congregation, Calvary Church here in Aurora, I mean every true, real church around the world. We're in this together, which the flip side of that is a reminder that we're not in this alone, that we're not isolated, that that we are partnering together with every true believer of every tribe, every tongue, and every nation. Now, we use the church, we use the word church a lot. And let me ask you, when you think of the word church, what almost immediately comes to mind? What do you think? It's the building. That's what we think. And and most likely, some of you today, when you woke up, you use that very language. Get up, it's time to go to church. But what you meant was, it's time to go to 18900 East Hampton Avenue, the building on the corner of Hampton and Biscay. Now, we don't say that, but that's what we mean. When you say you're going to church, you are most likely referring to the gathering that's going to happen at a particular time in a building. And so with that definition, what do we think? We drive by churches all the time. Uh, We talk about churches, and then we're we're thinking of buildings and locations. Uh, We go to church, whether it's an isolated building, or there's a gathering in a strip mall, or there's, like we did for many years, a gathering in a school nearby. We have church, we think about church, but I want you to consider the Bible on this topic is crystal clear, even if we are not so crystal clear. And the church, the definition of the church, the biblical understanding of the church is not a building at all. The the Bible describes the church as you, people. People are the church, the priesthood of all believers. You are the church. And it's not a building or an organization or a corporation or anything else that we might substitute for the church. You're the church in a very real way. The the Bible defines church as, there's really two Greek words, if you want to jot them down, that describe the church in the New Testament. Two Greek words. And remember, the New Testament was written in the common language of the first century, which is a language known as Koine Greek. It, it was like the, the common language of everyone. It wasn't the studious Greek, uh, but, but just the everyday language. You, today, you might even refer to the common language as kind of have slang words and, and cultural words. It, it was the Koine Greek. The Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and a little, some, of, some of the Old Testament was written in Aramaic as well. So when you're reading your English Bible, your translation, I have the New King James Version in front of me that's in English, it's a translation of the Greek language into a language that we can understand. And so they'll take the Greek language and they'll find the English word equivalent for it. And so there's two words in the original Greek that are used to describe the church. The first one is ekklesia, E-K-K-L-E-S-I-A. Ecclesia. And that word has the meaning called out ones. You have the idea of a group of people, and the ecclesia is a people called out of that group to be its own group. So you're called out. And that's a beautiful picture of the church, is it not? You have been called out of darkness. You've been called out. It has the idea of your name being mentioned. And you know, if you're in a crowded room and you hear your name, boom, immediately the attention goes to the person that said it. And so God has called you out of darkness, out of sin, out of this world. And that's a very important description of the church. A second word that's used in the New Testament to describe the church is the word sunogage. And that's S-U-N-A-G-O-G-U-E. Sunogage. 
And that might even sound very familiar to you already. It's from where we get our English word, synagogue. The word synagogue has the idea of the Jewish, of those that were Jews when they were in exile, they would come together for worship because they didn't have a temple. So they created, if there were 10 adult males, they'd come together in a synagogue. Well, the word in general simply means all together and assembled. That's all it means, to be assembled. And you know, there's a whole Christian denomination that's based their name on this very word, the assemblies of God. The idea is that there are believers that are assembled in the name of God. It's a great name for a group of churches. And while the Bible is clear, we may not be, but we are the church. And I want you to take ownership of that. So that as we've been studying through the book of Acts, you you have been repetitively reminded to be the church. You already are the church. So now God is saying, well then be what you are. Live out the life of Christ that is in you, the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. And to me, these words in the church is very encouraging. It's almost like God is saying, I'm bringing you out of the world and I'm bringing you together, I'm assembling you together for worship, for encouragement, and for edification. You and I have been saved from the world so that we go back into the world Transform. Jesus used the phrase born again. Paul said that we're new creations. So now that we, we haven't been removed from the world, we're like we're not moving into the mountains to live in a cave. We live in the world, but we're not no longer of the world. And that's why you feel so much frustration in our culture because you are going against the grain. You are going against against your life. God, it says you are otherworldly. And it's very challenging to live in a world where you're always going against the way it goes. And you're like, no, that's not right. That's not right. That, that's not true. And, and it's a very challenging. It gets tiring. It gets frustrating. So much so that some believers just decide, I don't want to go uh, against the grain anymore. I'll just join the world. It seems to be easier. But then you sell out your soul while you're doing that. You give away the ability to impact a culture for the cause of Christ. So here we are gathered together. And I think of our own little church. I think of our own little church. It's called out from all over the the metro area. And it always amazes me, whether you're visiting or this is part of your church, of all over the metro area, people will drive in. They're called out to assemble in one location to worship with other believers. From all over the metro area, from the mountains to the plains, God is bringing us together. And with the invention of technology, now we have people visiting us from all around the world. I was just talking about Grace FM uh, with Pastor Josh yesterday, uh, talking about Grace FM. And one of our number one, this is amazing to me, one of our number one countries that streams Grace FM on our app and on our website is Ukraine. We have so many people tuning in to our radio station from Ukraine and so many other um, countries as well. And that is the called out, gathered together. And I love the church. I love that God called me out and put me, landed me in a church, in his church, in a local church. I love the church. I love the gathering. The gathering is so important to me. And you're like, well, of course, Ed, you have to be here. It's your job. So it better be important to you. But no, it's not. I'm not here in this church because I'm the pastor. I'm not here for that primarily. I'm here because this is where God has planted me so that I might grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. This is where he planted me. Yes, this is my role. Yes, I do have a role here just like you have a role here. But you don't come to church because of your role. You come to church to love and express your worship of Jesus with other believers. You come to the gathering. You come to the gathering because God commands you to come to the gathering. And these last few years has like jacked that all up, hasn't it? So many people have not come back. They, they have gotten used to not being in the gathering. They have gotten used to like, I don't need it. I, I can watch it online. Well, and listen, you can like... Like, you got to understand online and radio ministries and YouTube stuff, you know, that, that is like, you got to think of that as like taking vitamins. You don't live on vitamins. They're good to take and they supplement your nutrition, but, but that's, you can't live on vitamins. 
And you have to have real nutrition. So if you think of it in that way, nutrition is gathering together. You go, come on, Ed, that's just like you, a pastor, telling people to come to church. Well, well, I am a pastor, and I am telling people to come to church, but God said, we learn this ourselves when we study through Hebrews verse by verse. God said to not neglect the gathering of the saints. He said that. That's for you. That's for your good. It's for our good. And I love the church. There isn't a time, very rarely, a time when I gather together with our church or I'm visiting another church or teaching another church that I don't leave more encouraged than when I walked in. That God doesn't speak to me, that he doesn't encourage me, he doesn't validate, some confirm something, I learn something new. So there's, there's not a time that I open up the word or I come together where I'm not encouraged or I have an opportunity to encourage. I love the church. I love the church. And I would just say, I know it's not everybody online, but man, for some of you that are online that just don't come back or aren't going back to your church, here's the word of the Lord. You ready? Go back or come back because we miss you as a part of the body as your gifts aren't being exercised here, but also you're in disobedience. Now I'm not talking about people that are sick or in the hospital or you know, have to be home for some reason with the kids that are sick or whatever. That's not, it, it is to the person that says, you know what? I like watching church in my jammies and hot chocolate. I like the ability to walk, and I can turn you down anytime I want. You know, it's like I'm my own sound man, you know. I'm, that, I'm talking about that because I, I, I was home a couple times during COVID watching online. Man, it's impossible to stay and to pay attention the whole time because you're there, you're worshiping, and you're enjoying it, and then, you know what? I got to go to the bathroom. I love you, Lord, and you're walking away, and you go to the restroom, and it's like you come back, you know, oh, my hot chocolate's out. So I turn on the hot water, you know, and it's like, before you know it, it's playing, but it's in the background. It's playing, but it's in the background. It's important that we come together. And one of the reasons, another reason why it's important to come together is you don't know how God's going to use it. You have to come with anticipation. You have to come ready so that the, God, the Holy Spirit can use us as a church. So let's think about the church in some different illustrations for a moment. And because I, we're going to end with an illustration in Romans 12. But I want you to think of the gathering. You know, you're the called out ones. We're assembled in one place and every true church around the world. So think about the church with a couple of illustrations. If you're taking notes, I want you to think of the church, first of all, like a hospital. Like a hospital. I want you to think of the church as a spiritual hospital. A place where the hurting and the sick, a place those, with those that are racked with spiritual pain and irrational fears and on the edge of hopelessness can come to be healed and nurtured back to health by our Savior. Think of the church as a hospital like a refuge, a place of safety, a place of shelter, a place of restoration, where broken things are mended, and care and concern is given. And even some of the sick that end up in a gathering, they get saved, they get healed eternally. But think of the church as a hospital, not as a museum where we, re we hold up these relics of the past and we think, oh, look what God has done in the past, but that God is presently working in the earth today and the primary way that the whole salvation works in a person's life is they are healed spiritually of the greatest sickness on the planet earth today, sin sickness. It is causing the most havoc in every single life today is sin. I want you to think of the church as a hospital, which means if you change your thinking a little bit and consider the gathering like a hospital, I know this might be new for some of you, and it's important that you grasp this and pray through it, but if, it, if the church is really a hospital, then you have to understand something. The place is filled with sick people. I would even dare say, as a typical hospital, there are more sick people in the hospital than there are those to take care of them. Sick. Sin sick. That means that there's going to be a lot of difficulties and messes and there's going to be a lot of hurting people. There's going to be a lot of opportunity to be hurt. Like you think of all the danger that a doctor or a nurse or, or those that work in the hospital atmosphere, how often they're exposed to sickness. How often it's just like right in their face. Sometimes they get coughed on or vomited on or like it, it, is, a, it, it is a risk 
that particular profession to work in a hospital. There's, there's lots of risk. Well, so is the church. You, you have the risk of having to deal with all kinds of stuff and having it come right directly to you. I mean, you, you can't respond to difficulties in the church to saying, what is wrong with this church? There's so much sin here. Well, we're not talking about like rebellious sin or sin that needs church discipline. We're just talking about life. And you just go, I can't believe it. So many sick people. I want to go to a church where there are no sinners. Well, it's not possible. That's silly. I want to go to a church with really refined, perfect people. That's just not possible. I mean, it, 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 we kind of laugh at it in the... We kind of laugh at it for a, for a church, but can you imagine a doctor having somebody come in, an ER doctor coming, somebody coming in with great need, and the doctor just responds, what is going on here? Well, why did you bring them here? I am so sick and tired of sick people. Take them somewhere else. I don't know, man, if that's not kind of like a doctor I want to see. Doctor is upset that we're bringing sick people to a hospital. And I want you to think of the church with a picture of a hospital. There's many, many parallels. Number two, I also want you to view the church as a restaurant. A restaurant. You go, Ed, what are you talking about? Well, the restaurant picture, the church becomes a spiritual place where believers and non-believers alike can come for a well-prepared feast in the word of God. Where I have a responsibility to pray and study and put together a meal to deliver to you so that you might digest God's word into your life. I, this is a great illustration because I think that it relates to almost all of us. And I'm not going to ask for hands here, but I want you to consider if you have a favorite restaurant. You have a favorite restaurant. Why do you have a favorite restaurant? Why, why do you like, why do you have a go-to restaurant? And I'll tell you why. The primary reason is you like the food. You don't go to some restaurants because the food maybe gave you some revenge five hours later. And so you don't go there anymore. But then you do have a go-to restaurant, and most likely at that go-to restaurant, you have a go-to meal. You order the same thing all the time. I know I do. I mean, why order something new and then take the risk of not liking it when I already know I like something, and I'm just going to order what I like? Anybody amen that? And it's like some of you, Ed, you're just weird. You don't try new things. Well, that's fine. I don't. I like what I like, and that's fine. And, and, and the church is very similar. You must be in a church where they feed you God's word, period. Verse by verse, chapter by chapter, of course, is our preference. Not in a church that just kind of mentions the Bible, or maybe it's over there, or, you know, don't worry about it. I'll tell you everything you need to know. No, no, no. You, you need to be in a place where you are well fed, that you take in the nourishment of God's word. Not the personality, not the charisma of the pastor, but a good word. If you think of the favorite restaurant analogy, that also helps to explain, especially those of you that might listen on the radio and you hear all these different pastors all day, three or four, let's just say you have a, a go-to block of time that you listen to the radio here in the Metro, Grace FM, you listen to Grace FM, you listen to a few teachers. This explains why you, you are a, attached to some pastors more than others. It's the same thing with a meal. It's not that they're not teaching well, and it's not that it wasn't well prepared. But remember what Jesus said? My sheep will hear the shepherd's voice, and there'll be a sense where you have an ear to hear. That's why some pastors are more relatable to you than others. It doesn't mean they're bad pastors. It doesn't mean they're bad teachers. It just means they're different, and you have a favorite you have someone that you receive from. You have someone that, that pours into you. For me, uh, that man would be Skip Heitzig. I've studied under Skip Heitzig since a new believer, so over 30 years. I mean, 30 years, I used to, back in the day, you, you, if he wasn't on the radio, you couldn't go online and catch the study. You either got on the radio or you lost it. But what they did back then is that you could sign up to have cassette tapes mailed to you every two weeks. Yes, cassette tapes, remember those? Every two weeks, and I'd be so eager to go to the mailbox and go, did I get my cassettes? Because you couldn't listen online, didn't have apps, and, and for 30 plus years I've been studying. I just, the Lord, I receive from him. I receive from Pastor Chuck. I receive from a lot of people, and some I don't receive much from. But it doesn't mean that they're not good teachers. It just means, hey, like I have a favorite restaurant, I also have pastors that really feed me well. Thirdly, thirdly, think of the church as a hospital. Come ready to be fed 
um, to receive a, a good meal. And then thirdly, I want you to consider the church like a training center, a training center. And this would be a place where spiritually you and I are being trained for the work of the ministry. That's actually my job description from the scriptures that I might be used of God with his word to equip the saints for the work of the ministry so that you might be effective in your life for Jesus Christ. Or in Colossians chapter two, verse six, it says that you and I would be rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught. And so we see the church where men and women can come and be taught to be strengthened, to be supported in their lives and in ministry, trained how to study the Bible for yourself, trained how to serve, trained how to show the gospel, on and on, a training center. Fourthly, hospital, restaurant, training center. Number four, I want you to view the church as a gymnasium, a gymnasium, as if you're going to the gym, a place where, a spiritual place where believers can discover and exercise, that's where the word comes, gymnasium, so you can exercise your spiritual gifts. And that's the journey we're on right now. You're gonna learn so you can exercise your spiritual gifts. That way we can then understand that the responsibility of ministry is not solely on the pastor or the pastors or the elders. The responsibility of ministry is on all of us equally. I don't have more of a responsibility than you do as a believer in Jesus Christ. We all have the equal responsibility to be faithful to God in the place that he's called us. And this is your home church. This is it. This is where God has you. This is where he brought you. This is the important place where your gifts are exercised. And then finally, I'd like to also have you consider the church as a launching pad, a launching pad. This, this really speaks to an elaboration of the vision of our church. When, when a person of Christ, disciple, build or teach a person in Christ, and then finally, send, a launching pad, where when you think on it, when you think about that, this is a place where believers, we come, we fellowship, we break bread together, we pray, we're equipped, we're prepared, and then we're sent right back out. And that's exactly what's gonna happen in a few moments. You're gonna be sent right back out. This is not, I know you already know this, but for the sake of understanding, this is not the sole essence of your relationship with Jesus Christ, 90 minutes in a building. You know that? This is not it. This, this is just a small part, a very significant. Sometimes we think small things are insignificant. No, 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 no. It's a significant small part of your life that will equip you for the rest of your week, at work, at home, on the bus, delivering packages, processing people's groceries, all of that, studying, school. It is a launching pad. You have to see yourself missionally. You have to see yourself on mission. God is using you. So amazing. And as we abide in Christ, God does so much. Let me give you one more, and you go, Ed, are we ever gonna get to Romans? Yes, we're landing there right now. Romans chapter 12, verse one. There's one more illustration I wanna offer you today as it relates to now the prelude to spiritual gifts. Romans chapter 12, notice with me verse one. I beg you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. For I say through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. For as we have many members in one body, we, but all the members do not have the same function, so we are being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And then he goes right into it, having then gifts differing. And that's where we'll be next time. So here's the last picture that I want you to consider, and that is, I want you to think of the church as a body, 
a physical body, arms, hands, eyes, you know, internal organs, external. We are a body. And, and a body has individual parts, but the individual parts are part of a whole. And that's how God wants you to see the church. We are all very individual, every single one of us. There isn't two alike. Even identical twins are not identically alike. They're alike in many ways, but they're very individual. And so you have individual upbringings, individual perspectives, individual, I mean, the differences, male and female, young and old, uh, you know, individuals and where you are. That we're so, and even in our culture, right, we've just been, been taught to be very individualistic. And, and there is some truth to that. We are unique. There is only one of us on the planet. God has a purpose and a plan for you specifically and uniquely. And you need to understand that. And I think we probably understand that more than we understand we're part of a whole. We are part of a body that you're not as individual as you think you are because you're part of something bigger than you. And in that part of what you're bigger than you, you are part of what God's plan is. And as we're going to learn with the seven gifts, seven, the number of completion in the scriptures, these seven gifts represent the wholeness or the completeness of the ministry of Jesus Christ through us as if he was on the earth today. So when all the seven gifts are operating, all they're, they're all moving among us, then in a collaborative way, a church, and this is amazing in the spiritual realm, a church of Jesus represents him on the earth accurately. That's how he is still here as the Holy Spirit's in us. No one of us accurately represents the wholeness of Jesus, but together, I mean, we could do so much more together than we can ever do alone, and God made it that way. Consider the church as a body. And this is a great picture of the church because we all have bodies, and we understand this. We understand the significance of parts of our body that maybe we don't pay attention to until they get hurt. You know, you think about someone that throws out their back. You never think of your back until you throw it out. And you're like, oh, maybe, maybe differently. <laughs> or you're up in the middle of the night having to get something to drink. You're coming down the stairs. You, make a cor- you cut a corner too short and you stub your toe. What hurts when you stub your toe? Everything. Everything. You know, you think of, you think of the, the, the parts of your body that are so important, but you never really think of it that way until necessity comes. And God says, no, I don't want you to think that way when it comes to the church. You're already already the necessity. I want you to think of your individuality, but how you fit in the bigger picture. That you're not alone. This is not your own deal. You can't do your own thing. In your own individuality, you have to think about, and Paul says, and if you want to study these things, you really want to get ahead. All the studies we've done on the entirety of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit are on the app. And also in the book of Romans, I think I took eight to ten weeks going through these verses. So this is told, This is just a quick, quick overview, but we went through from verse one to verse five, point by point by point by point, launching us into the gifts. I chose not to do that this time because we're studying through the book of Acts, but if that's something that interests you, they're all up on the app, all up on the website, and you can go through and kind of see the progression of the Holy Spirit leading us to this point. But it's enough to remember today that you're a part of the body. I mean, think of your own body. Think, think of if you woke up one morning and, and you're like, something's wrong with your hands and you pull your hand up like this and you go, what is wrong with you? And your hand says, oh, well, let me tell you something. You know, your, your 10 fingers start talking to you and they say, we've decided we don't like you anymore, Ed. And we're going on strike. Why? I need you. Well, we don't need you anymore. We don't like you. You're always putting your hand in your pocket and it's dark in there. And I don't like it. And we're going on strike. Pretty dumb illustration, huh? It's so dumb. It's dumb. Just say it. Go ahead, say it out loud. Ed, that's just dumb. Go ahead. It's dumb. Saturday night didn't think I had to make them say, but it is. It's a dumb illustration. You just can't wake up and go, oh, I'm, I'm going on strike. I'm going to do my own thing. It's just dumb. Your hands aren't going to do that. Well, now that you agree with me that it's dumb, it's an illustration. It's equally dumb for the church, people in the church to go, you know what, I don't need church anymore. I don't need to be with saints anymore. 
I'm on strike. I don't like that church. And you know what happens? There's a lot of different ways it happens, but people give up. Or the more popular one is this thing of church hopping. You just go to this church, this church, this church. That's not will the will of God for you. God is not saying, oh, go visit there, and you like this over there, and you like that over there, and you like this over there, and like, like the whole world is yours, and you can make up your own sandwich by all the different churches that you visit. I like the donuts over there, the coffee over there, the parking over there, all of that. That is not God's will for your life. God's will for your life is to go to the church family that he has planted you in, serve there, submit there, and don't leave until he tells you to. And that is where longevity and perseverance comes in because that's where you grow up, where you press in, you persevere. Yeah, there are things you don't like, of course. And yeah, this church is better at that. All of that might be true, but that is not why God has created the church. He's created the church as a body. And so your 10 fingers go, oh, you know, I like that body over there. And then, the, you know, your hands take off and now that guy has 20 fingers and you have none. That doesn't make any sense. It just doesn't make any sense. And that's why I think God, and Paul will use this similar silly illustration in the, to the Corinthian church. You know, want to know why? Because their biggest issue was divisiveness and division. And he's like, you guys, you're acting contrary to who you are. The body is unified, we're interrelated, we are interdependent. Yes, there is independence among us, but in our independence, we are interdependent. And all that word means is, I need you in my life, and you need me. I didn't say, I want you, and I didn't say, you want me. I said, we need each other, and that's very important. And most of the time, we want each other. Most of the time, there's a desire. God matches. He's so good to us, isn't he? He doesn't go, you need it, just do it because you have to. No, then he creates an environment, no, I want it. I don't only need it, I want it. This is a refreshment. It's one of the reasons why we do a midweek Bible study here. So many of you need to really pray about making that a part of your life. One of the reasons we have a midweek is because some people can't last three days in this world without coming back together with the saints coming back together to pray and to have communion together, to be together at the table, uh, to have another dose of precise Bible study for us as a church. It's important just midweeks, like, man, I, I, I've had such a wild week. I need to ref be refreshed. I need to be strengthened. And so the Bible says that we're one body, but we're interdependent. We need each other. And to me, it's a huge relief to know that I don't need to be anyone else. I don't need to copy anyone else. I don't need to try to ascribe to someone. I can just be who I am in the Lord. And it frees me. I can serve with freedom. You know, somebody comes up, you know, I didn't like that Bible, so you're not like my favorite pastor. Great, I'm not trying to be like your favorite pastor. Fine, I'm free, this is who I am. God called you here, deal it, deal with it. Let the Lord strengthen you, learn. But I don't, I don't have those insecure days like I did in the early days. Somebody would tell me, oh man, I gotta be like your pastor. I don't need to be like your pastor. I just need to be me. And you know what? You just need to be you. Don't try to be anybody else. Remember what Paul said? Paul said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's where we're headed. That's what it says right here in Romans, to be not conformed to this world, but be transformed. You're being transformed into the image of Christ. And I'm especially... I'm especially grateful for the diversity in our church. I'm especially grateful for the diversity on our staff and our team and our leaders. It makes for an exciting time of ministry with so many ideas, so many perspectives, but one spirit, one direction, one body. And so as we come to the communion table today, that is an essential part of the communion table, unity. We're not in unity as Calvary Church of Aurora, although that's a part of it. And we're not in unity as with, with uh, the, you know, Grace Church up um, on the other side of the parking lot, although we are. Pastor Larry and the team, there's a wonderful church. It's unity, it's not even in unity with every other single church in the whole world that worships Jesus. The unity of communion is in Christ. So it bypasses all of our differences. We, you really, on the way to the table, you almost have to, in your mind, 
lay aside your differences. Lay aside your likes and dislikes. And Jesus, he invites us to say, I want you to remember this important part. I gave my body and my blood for you. And I gave my body and blood for the person sitting next to you. And I gave my body and blood for the person in front of you. And the singular focus of our lives is not church and vision and pastors and radio. The singular vision is Jesus. Jesus. And so, Father, as we come to the communion table today, we pray for your Holy Spirit to bring unity in us as we singularly put our eyes upon you. There are prodigal children represented in this room, but our eyes are on you. There are heavy addictions today, but our eyes are on you. There's even divorce and discouragement. Our eyes are on you. I think of those among us that may have in their past had an abortion before they were saved and because it's the topic now, it's bringing back all these feelings of guilt and shame that nobody ever told them about. The focus is you and your forgiveness. It's all about you, God. And we come to you now afresh and anew asking for you to wash us and cleanse us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.